extremely proud of it. We are honored to be on this great campus and be able to partner with the SMU community and its world-class faculty, and we've always enjoyed sharing our programs with SMU students and the broader community. In addition, principled leadership never goes out of style. President and Mrs. Bush have set the example, and we want to follow it. My hope is that the Bush Center will always serve as a place where timeless principles are celebrated, protected, and promoted. We've had a great start. Now we must make sure our mission endures for generations to come. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mrs. Laura Bush. Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome to the Bush, the, this Engage event at the Bush Center. A special thanks to Next Point for their endowment of our Engage series. Thanks to their generosity, we're able to bring terrific speakers and programs to the Bush Center for all of our guests to enjoy. I'd like to recognize our board members and executive advisory council members who are here tonight. Would you all please stand if you're a board member or an executive council member? Thank you all. Uh, we have a special guest tonight, Stuart McLaren, the president of the White House Historical Association. Where's Stuart? There, Stuart. Stand up so everybody can see you. Thanks. And thanks for everyone here for joining us. I think you'll find this program a lot of fun because I know what fun it was to work with the White House social secretaries. The social secretaries who, um, who are here tonight um, are the ones that I worked with were Catherine Fenton, Lee Berman, and Amy Zanzinger, and Amy has joined us tonight. She'll be here on the stage. When I think of the countless events we planned with our social secretaries, I especially remember in early 2007, when we learned that Queen Elizabeth would make another visit to the United States. Preparations for this dinner included two of our local social secretaries, Lee Berman, who was departing after the two years, and Amy Zanzinger, who was with us for the rest of George's term, and I think Amy is here tonight. Is she right here on the front? Anyway, you may know that there, you may not know that there's a flower shop in the basement of the White House. And for, uh, for seven administrations, the White House florist was Nancy Clark. When George's dad was president and he was inaugurated, it was a bitterly cold day. Little Barbara and Jenna got cold during the ceremony, so they rushed into the White House before the inaugural parade was finished. I knew the staff was wildly unpacking all of the Bush's belongings so that the house would be ready for them when they walked in. Sweet Nancy Clark, the florist, met Barbara and Jenna at the door and took them down to the floral shop. She helped them make bouquets for their grandparents' bedside tables. <laughs> and nearly 20 years later, Nancy Clark was the one who did the flowers for Jenna's wedding. <laughs> for the Queen's visit, Amy and I worked with Nancy to decorate the state dining room with white roses in vermeil vases and with used the gold, and we used the gold-edged Clinton china. Our menu tastings with our talented White House chef, Chris Cumberford, were done weeks in advance, and everything was designed to showcase the best of America with a nod to British favorites. For the dinner was to be white tie. George, of course, didn't want to wear white tie. <laughs> but when we visited Buckingham Palace in 20, 2003, Prince Philip and the Queen's guests all had donned white tie for us. So Condi Rice and I made the executive decision that this evening would be white tie as well, much to George's chagrin. <laughs> the arrival ceremony was under perfectly beautiful blue skies, and that afternoon, Queen Elizabeth asked to visit the newly opened World War II Memorial. We suggested that George's dad, who was in town for the uh, dinner, serve as her escort. So the 82-year-old World War II fighter pilot lent his arm to the woman who had been a beautiful teenage princess when that war raged. The guest list for the state dinner was fun to compile, particularly the invitation I was waiting till the very end 
to extend. The queen is a fan of horse racing, and she'd attended the Kentucky Derby the weekend before, come, at, before coming to the White House. I watched the Derby on TV, and the moment it ended, I called Amy with a request. Invite the winning jockey, Calvin Burrell. <laughs> when she reached out to him, he thought it was a joke. <laughs> Amy convinced him that it was indeed the White House calling, and he said yes, he would attend. But he had his fiancee, Lisa, and he wanted to bring her, and she needed to go shopping for something suitable to wear. And Lisa and Calvin are married now. After hearing about the invitation, the stores in Louisville, Kentucky stayed open on Sunday so Lisa could come in and find a dress. As for Calvin, Amy arranged to rent a set of white tails from the same man who was outfitting George for the, for the evening. All during dinner, I could see Calvin and Lisa at a nearby table, and they looked so happy. He had his arm draped over her in an expression of bliss, winning the Kentucky Derby on Saturday, and on Monday night, dining with the Queen of England at the White House. <laughs> but not all the events social secretaries plan are as elegant or intimate as a state dinner with the Queen. Social secretaries plan all the personal and official events for the President and First Lady, including two events each year for the entire members of Congress. And at over a thousand guests, each of those events were quite memorial, memorable, rather. <laughs> at one congressional picnic, a member of the House leadership got so drunk that he threw up in the bushes. <laughs> The social staff had to maneuver him away from the nearby press pool. <laughs> Alcohol is no stranger to some members of Congress. <laughs> social office staffers were waiting to grant another member, greet another member when he arrived at the White House. And when his driver pulled to a stop, the man who was already tipsy took a swig of something and then proceeded to split, spit it in the bushes. It was mouthwash, presumably. <laughs> to mask whatever he'd imbibed, imbibed before. The Congressional Ball, the largest event of the holiday season, was also a substantial undertaking. The receiving line for photos lasted for three solid hours. Some senators and representatives wanted to bring additional guests, even their entire families, although the ball numbers already topped 1,000 people, and the event was spread onto every inch of two full floors of the White House. Rather than just one oversized buffet, we worked to make a, the ball a real party. Downstairs was a quieter and more reserved, but on the state floor, we had music and dancing. We searched the country for great unusual bands, and in 2001, our band was Rotel and the Hot Tomatoes. <laughs> they still, I think, still play, but they're old now. <laughs> At every ball by midnight, there would still be 60 or more party goers dancing, and more than once the social staff had to intervene to prevent the conga line of senators and representatives from parading up the marble steps to the private residence where George and I were, of course, already asleep in our bed. <laughs> So I want to congratulate the White House Social Secretaries on a job well done. They balance it all with their meticulous attention to detail, with beautiful style, and strict but effective chaperoning. And they do it all with grace. So now I'd like to introduce the three former Social Secretaries who've joined us tonight. Jeremy Bernard was the White House Social Secretary to President and Mrs. Obama. Is Jeremy going to come out? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Gail Hodges Burt was the White House Social Secretary to President and Mrs. Reagan. And Amy Zanzinger worked for George and me for our last two years at the White House. My former Chief of Staff, Anita McBride, who just co-authored the book, Remember the First Ladies, and maybe some of you showed up today to buy the book. She was selling it here at the shop will serve as the moderator. So please help me welcome Jeremy Bernard, Gail Hodges-Burt, Amy Zanzinger, 
and Anita McBride as they share stories about using the White House as a stage for hospitality and diplomacy. Thank you all. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bush. A wonderful introduction and terrific to be with these wonderful panelists. Again, this is a reprise of a conversation that we had at the Presidential Site Summit in September. So thank you to the Bush Center for inviting us to come back and share it with all of you here in Dallas. There is no one better equipped than the social secretaries to talk about all the planning behind the scenes at the White House for events large and small, as you've heard Mrs. Bush describe. So we thought we would start at least to touching upon the historical origins of the role of social secretary and recognize the first White House social secretary, Isabella Bell Hagner. We have a photo of her, and she really looks like you want to party with her. Very, very attractive. The mosquito netting around her face is very inviting. But Bell worked as a clerk at the War Department and was transferred to the White House to work with First Lady Edith Roosevelt, who had come to the White House with a rambunctious family of five and needed help managing social obligations and media requests. In her memoir, she has a terrific quote that I want to read, and then I'm going to ask Jeremy to be the first to respond to this. Until one has held a position of this kind, it is impossible to realize the ingenuity of the human mind in making their requests. So, Jeremy, I'd love for you to share an example of that, an ingenious request. That was said so much more beautifully than <laughs> I ever said it, and I said something of the lines. Uh, very, I, I, we all had uh, requests and ish, people issues about where they're sitting or how far away they were from the president or the first lady or anything, but. Some of them were just way over the top, and one was someone that was coming to the White House for an unofficial, wasn't on the schedule, meeting with the president. It's going to be at noon. He arrived at, at Dulles, and he had a good hour and a half, but he called to say he didn't really know if they would make it on time. So could he have permission? He could, Brent, he could get this helicopter and helicopter onto the South Lawn. <laughs> and I did, it, at first I thought he was joking, I laughed, and then when he said, no, it, it's, I have it, <laughs> I, I, I've already, you know, Arranged reserved it. it. And I was like, well, first of all, only the president lands on the South Lawn. It, it, not even the first lady just lands <laughs> on the, the vice president doesn't land on the South Lawn. One person lands on the South Lawn, and it is not you. <laughs> <laughs> this, it, just to show it didn't deter, he, he took that, but about a year later, he wanted to go to Martha's Vineyard. The Obamas were there and the airspace was closed. And he said, could you call and open the airspace so he could fly in? <laughs> so that also was a no, but I gave that one to Valerie Jarrett. <laughs> I think that meets the test of Bell's, of Bell's memoir, that's for sure. Well, you heard, would either one of you like to add to an ingenious you request? Top that. It's pretty hard to top, but I want to give you. Hard. I want to give you the option. Of well, life. I did have a, a, a performer um, who said that he could not come without his psychiatrist, and that terrible things would happen <laughs> if, if I didn't allow the psychiatrist to not only come, but sit next to him at dinner and keep him calm. And what, what could I do? I, I was afraid that something terrible would happen. So, so I, I let the psychiatrist Just come. come. And, <laughs> and everything was okay. <laughs> I don't think the Bushes had any friends or requests like One this, of my right? favorites was we would always ask when guests were coming for a dinner, 
or a meal if they had any dietary restrictions. <laughs> and the things people would say, well, I don't like this and I don't like that, it, they sort of lost sight of the number of people that would <laughs> we would be serving and they would get into these minute specifics and I'm, I, this is not a menu. This is, just, <laughs> this is not an allergy. It's not a, right, right. <laughs> Well, let's do, you've heard Mrs. Bush describe the, the state visit for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, which was really a magnificent night for everyone at, at the White House. But we thought we'd show you a picture of the first state dinner ever held at the White House. And this was hosted by President Ulysses S. Grant for the King of Hawaii in 1874. Very attractive. Uh, Kevin Sullivan, who works here, said he is sure this is what the Hawaiian king rolls, so this is who it's named for. Looks better than the first <laughs> social secretary. <laughs> I'm pretty know, sure. Definitely. There are a lot of medals there. Um, but tradition, of course, dictates that certain elements are always incorporated uh, into a state visit, but presidents and first ladies get to make each state visit their own. So I'm sure everyone here would like to hear a little bit more about the process, what happens behind the scenes, who's involved, how the decisions are made about guest lists and invitations, menus, gifts, and entertainment, all the elements required for a perfect state visit. So Gail, may I ask you first about the process of putting together the guest list? I mean, the Reagans had incredible friends from Hollywood and others. How did you manage that? Well, in 1983, you must understand, it was the Stone Age. Uh, <laughs> there were no computers. There was no internet. There was nothing except paper and pen. And I had an IBM correcting selectric typewriter. <laughs> With an emphasis on the word correcting, because you could also get one that was not correcting. And then you had the bottle of whiteout, and you know. So it was uh, labor intensive. And uh, I would start putting guest lists together about, the Reagans had a state dinner ele every month for 11 months, uh, August, yeah we took the month off, but there was a state dinner every month. So we would plan these things out about six months and I would start collecting ideas for the guest list. I would start booking entertainment. Um, I think one of the things that is sort of sad, but um, for Republicans, not every, you had it easy for entertainment. Yes. I mean, anybody, <laughs> anybody, anybody would go and perform at the Obama White House. <laughs> Reagan, not so much. <laughs> and, you know, there was a lot of, um, we had the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities, an award, and half of the people wouldn't accept the award from Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what it was like. So we had a lot of country and Western, <laughs> um, uh, uh, and they all, they, so would, they, they, so would, <laughs> they would all come, that Sinatra. was good. And Frank Sinatra did all of our um, s sound and light for the East Room. He was like the technician. And he, because the East Room was very difficult to, um, to sort of mic and to get it to sound well, and Frank came in and did everything, and he would call a potential entertainer mm -hmm. and sort of lay the groundwork for me to then uh, uh, book them. And, uh, and I was very grateful to have Frank Sinatra do that for me. But still, there were a lot of people yeah. that would not perform in a, at a Republican White House. Mm. Um, and because it was the Stone Age and we were, you know, paper and pencil, Mrs. Reagan and I would literally get down on the floor okay. upstairs with squares and we would do our seating all on the floor and we would crawl over to that one. And, <laughs> um, 
you know, there was there was no <laughs> computer to type this into, and voila, it got sent everywhere. We had messengers that ran around from the east wing to the west wing, and you would give them your paper and tell them where it had to be delivered. And um, you know, my phone calls were all on these yellow um, little call sheets, and there was no time really to return phone calls um, <laughs> until about 10 o'clock at night. And that's when I learned I would return my phone calls at 10 o'clock at night because nobody was there. I could just leave a voicemail. <laughs> and at least, <laughs> at least I'd done my duty and I'd But at that to time when you were doing invitations, people had to call in to respond, right? So you had just a team of people just taking I phone calls? I had two people that did nothing but take RSVPs over the phone. Yeah. Um, and of course, it was all done through snail mail and, right. um, and phone calls. So it, it was a different time. It was a different time. Yeah. Amy, can I ask you a little bit about Beyond the Invitations, the menu and the flowers? Yes, um, Mrs. Bush touched on it earlier that often there would be a tasting menu prior to the dinner. And she had the brilliant idea to invite members of Congress. And what a better way to soften their hearts than <laughs> to have them to the White House for a tasting for a state dinner. Um, when the dinner takes place, um, often it's in the state dining room and there are only, there's only room for 120 guests. So this was a wonderful opportunity to spread the wealth in sharing in the exciting event, but uh, and allowing them to come to uh, a, a lovely dinner in the private residence. Um, as far as the flowers, um, we all know Mrs. Bush has an incredible knowledge of flowers and a Impe impeccable palette. We can see by what she's done here at the Bush Center, which is so lovely. Um, we would, Mrs. Bush would help create a vision of what she thought the flowers and palette should look like for that evening. And then Nancy Clark and I would go back and create two or three different scenarios for her to look at, and we would present them to her in the state dining room. The tablecloths, the china, and the flowers, um, which was a wonderful way to see them in their surroundings. And then with great attention to detail, the president, Mrs. Bush, would select gifts for the visiting heads of state. Mm -hmm. And for uh, Prime Minister Kuzami from Japan, when he came to visit, they knew he liked Elvis, so they found a vintage refurbished jukebox and filled it with <laughs> records from Elvis, and then following the state dinner the next day, they went to Graceland. And that was the best. Which was the best. <laughs> Everyone's in their Elvis glasses. I still have mine. That was so fun. <laughs> Jeremy, can you talk a little bit about we, this too? So we were at the point where we were switching to doing some invitations by email, which was a tough uh, sell to the calligraphers. Uh, but Mrs. <laughs> Obama still wanted for state dinners to send out the invitations as in the past, but then also email because people responded mm -hmm. uh, by email. And for some events that weren't state dinner, it, that were, we didn't have the time, we'd still have the invitation or the menus printed out and hand them to people mm -hmm. as they came in. So they had the invite. But I, we, we didn't do near as uh, uh, the trappings that you did for the tasting. I went up, I had just been at the White House for about a month, and we were preparing for the Germany state dinner, and I went to do the tasting in the Yellow Oval with mm -hmm. Mrs. Obama and Mrs. Robinson. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was nervous, mother. it was so Her all mother. new, and so right before, I was trying to get some type of gossip, something that I could bring to the table. <laughs> was, and someone told me, oh, it's gonna come out the next week that a governor, I'm not gonna say where, California, but <laughs> had an affair and it was with the housekeeper. Um, well, oh. I, I told yeah. that and it was like, Mrs. Robinson, oh my God, it was the best start. <laughs> it made, 
and we were also tasting the wine. So it was the wine. I was like, after a while, I was like, you know, this is, I'm not so nervous now. The oddest part was, we're, so we're in the residence in the Yellow Oval, and the president walked in, and it was the first time I had seen him up in the residence. There was no Secret Service with him, which I got used to always there. And he came in, and he goes, hello, 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 hello. And Mrs. Obama said, turn over the menu, turn it over. She didn't want him to see it because she was like, we're going to decide this, not him. But, and I was like, do I turn it over? I mean, he is my boss. But, <laughs> but it, was, uh, it was really, I loved the tastings because it was yeah. uh, a time we kind of relaxed and mm -hmm. decided on the menu, obviously, but it was also kind of a relaxed, informal time. How about the, the budget for state events? Very, the, the uh, state dinners were financed by the State Department. The White House had no account. And it always surprised people when I'd say, well, we can't do that because of the budget. And the budget was such that most of the time it also didn't allow, my first state dinner was set up in the Rose Garden. We had a two-day window to decide as it got close mm. whether we had to move it inside. Mm -hmm. And, but they would, the State Department didn't give the money that would allow us to put a tent up. So every, every state dinner was a battle. And the only thing I would, I would be like, well, you can't have a state dinner on Monday. And I remember Secretary of State, why? I said, because <laughs> Sunday it costs more for the mm -hmm. staff to be there to set up. So we have to do Tuesday through Friday. <laughs> but it was really, people were surprised. Very limited for entertainment. Mm -hmm. You paid for the flight, mm -hmm. but it was really basic. And if it was a big group, the main person got their airfare paid for. But it was always a, a battle with the State Department so, on the amount. Gail, and, did you have that? You didn't have that. So I had no budget. I, <laughs> I, I didn't have to consult with anyone. That's I, why the deficit went up. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I don't know when they instituted budgets. Maybe we had budget. during, yeah. but <laughs> This is how some, long ago. Yeah, this it was, was sometime between yeah. our because we had a budget. <laughs> All right. it, something worked in the Stone Age right for me. Um, but we touched upon a little bit technology, how technology changed things, but you did some different things. Sure, it was, so Mrs. Obama really didn't like that people would come in and, and be so focused on getting the right photo or video, I mean now it's kind of more of the norm, but then she really did, she said they should enjoy the moment and not be focused on showing off the moment. So for some of the uh, events at the White House that were uh, a little smaller, we actually had a, a check-in where people checked their phones in. Wow. So they didn't, she also didn't well, like we the didn't idea. have phones. <laughs> <laughs> no budget, no phones, Rose. the good and the bad. <laughs> But the, the main uh, difference was the, probably was the invitations. And one of the things we had a problem with is people would say, I, I didn't get my invitation. So we had people calling because often it went to spam. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so people today, emailed, to this day. You would, emailed. Yes, we emailed and people to this day, you know, they don't say, oh, thank you for inviting me to the most beautiful event of the life. They were like, I never got it. <laughs> I said, did you check your email? Because it probably went to spam. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to quote another fir first lady, a wonderful first lady right here. Laura Bush said in her memoir, if the four-hour evening is flawless, it's because hundreds of hours have been invested before and no detail is too small. So now I'd like to hear from each of you. Tell us about an event that you organized that maybe did not go according to plan. It would be fun to sort of hear that. And Gail, I'm gonna ask you first, if you would. Well, we had a state dinner um, where, uh, you know, the Reagans were from Hollywood, so we always had a fair amount of 
Hollywood celebrities at our dinners. Um, they would come, so were the ones that were <laughs> friendly with the Reagans. So that was always fun. And we had a, the Reagans would always invite, as I'm sure you all mm -hmm. wishes did, would invite their friends to come to the state arrival ceremony, which was in the morning, um, which was on the South Lawn. You know, the, the, the two heads of state would review the troops. There were lots of troops out there from the four services. There was uh, uh, the 21 or 19 gun salute, depending on what rank the foreign visitor was. So there was a whole array of military um, on the South Lawn. And the Reagan's friends all had a special spot on the South Lawn where they would um, put their, uh, in a stanchion area where their friends would be. For whatever reason, Charlton Heston decided that he would just take it upon himself to walk around and look at the troops himself <laughs> um, instead of waiting for the two principals to review the troops. And he was out there just walking around and the press were on stanchions behind us, risers behind us. And we had one particular press corps person, Sam Donaldson, for mm -hmm. those of you in the crowd who knew his reputation, it was, he started shouting, get Heston out of the shot. <laughs> and um, so we had um, walkie to we didn't have phones, we had walkie talkies <laughs> that, were, like that were about this big with a rubber <laughs> antenna on top. I would clip my walkie talkie very fashionably on my belt and walk around with it. Everybody could hear what was going over those walkie talkies. <laughs> And so I said into my walkie-talkie, could someone please get Charlton Heston and bring him back to the <laughs> viewing area? <laughs> and without missing a beat, over the walkie-talkie comes a Secret Service agent and says, you can't stop Moses. <laughs> Everybody could hear that because it came <laughs> over our, through the walkie-talkie system. Oh my gosh. And so anyway, everybody did laugh and we went and got Moses and brought him back to where I to think where we have a picture be. of Mr. <laughs> uh, Heston who was behaving later in they the just evening. showed it there, there in the there. in the in the receiving line he was behaving here meeting <laughs> Prime Minister Thatcher that's a great story <laughs> Jeremy how about you so talking about having entertainment they usually did say yes but I had at one point um, I really used the resources of uh, the uh, sorority plus me, um, <laughs> and I would meet with some, usually it was uh, Lee or Gail, or, and I'd ask questions or talk about a problem. Sometimes it was over wine, depending on the problem. But at one point, Gail said to me, w you should know everything that's going on in D.C. as far as entertainment. What's at Kennedy Center, what's at all the theaters, because <clears throat> it, when someone cancels, and they will. You should know what's going on so you can get someone. And Mrs. Obama's, one of her favorite events was the Kids' State Dinner, mm -hmm. which was actually a lunch. But it was her favorite event, and we had an entertainer set, and we, as with all these events, had worked months in advance. And within a week before, I got a call that the entertainer couldn't come because we weren't providing a jet mm. for another request. The person and their whole team. And I said, you know, we have no budget. Budget. <laughs> we have no money. And you know, even if we did, this would not be a good press story. That this is how right. we're. I would have had a budget. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's uh, thus we we had a much tougher deal, and I was. Like, what are we going to do? And remembered what you said, and 
The Lion King was being performed at the Kennedy Center. And so when I went to Mrs. Obama to tell her of the cancellation, which was not easy, uh, <laughs> at least I had that backup. And it really, I, I thank goodness that Gail had given me that advice because that, that cancellation came as a real jolt. Yeah, of course. I'm not going to say who it is. But the okay. Lion King for kids must have been wonderful. She actually said afterwards, you know what, this was much better. Yes, see, much better. that's right. You know how to quickly pivot. Amy, how about you? So the final dinner, uh, state dinner, um, under the present Mrs. Bush was with Silvio, Silvio Berlusconi. And at the beginning of every dinner, the principals each give a toast to acknowledge the wonderful friendship between the, the two countries. And President Bush graciously gave his toast and sat down. And then Silvio Berlusconi got up and, as a passionate Italian, <laughs> started giving his toast and his arms were moving, and the next thing you knew, he grabbed the Eagle podium, and it literally <laughs> hopped off, somehow came <laughs> off the base. And he stood there and just continued to give his toast, <laughs> holding the Eagle podium. <laughs> so giving his speech. <laughs> and then as everyone erupted in laughter, the unflappable White House butler, James Ramsey, who you could see in the first photo. Yeah. Um, there he is, uh, yeah. a favorite of all of ours, um, <laughs> graciously took the podium from him at the end of the show. <laughs> oh, that was a great memory. What a great way to end the state dinners, right? Okay, so you've all, we've talked about the events you've planned, participated um, in, and, and many of them have been very historic events at the White House. So we have a few photographs, one photograph for each of you that I'd like you to describe the backstory behind. Gail, I'm gonna go with you first. This is a well-known photograph. So, um, we started planning this dinner about six months in advance. Um, we did not have a hard time getting anybody to come to this state. <laughs> um, but what uh, Mrs. Reagan said to me, you know, you, you should have someone there who can dance with Diana. And so I, I you know, Fred Astaire was dead. <laughs> I, um, so I'm thinking, and Saturday Night Fever had been uh, 10 years in the 70s, and this is the 80s. Um, so I suggested John Travolta, and she said, oh, no. Um, she said, you know, I think you should find someone more current. And so I thought about it overnight. I couldn't think of, Patrick Swayze as a dancer didn't exist yet. And I, I couldn't think of anyone more current. So I went to her the next day and I said, you know, I've, I've talked to some people, I've thought, but I just, um, Diana likes disco, John Travolta did disco. So to me, it was like a, a good fit. She said, oh, well, Really, you can't think of anyone more current? And so she agreed. And I got the, um, the producer of Saturday Night Fever was a man, wonderful man, an Australian named Robert Stigwood. And he founded the Bee Gees and produced the, all of the Saturday Night Fever movies. I called him and got the score from the music for the Marine Band. They, I gave it to them, I said, rehearse this because you gotta figure out how to play this and because he's going to ask Diana to dance. And, um, and so they did and uh, Travolta actually was very shy mm. and you know, he, he had to be sort of pushed out there. Um, they did dance together, um, and 
Diana, when it was over, curtsied to him. Mm. I think somewhere there's a picture of that. We don't have it, but she curtsied to him. He bowed. It was absolutely lovely. Um, he had been making these dreadful, and by the way, Mrs. Reagan was right. He'd been making these dreadful movies, <laughs> these those look who's talking baby movies. <laughs> and, 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 his next movie was Pulp Fiction, for which he won an Oscar. So I take full credit <laughs> for reviving his career. Absolutely. That's great. That's perfect. Amy, we heard Mrs. Bush, of course, talk about Queen, the uh, dinner with Queen Elizabeth. Um, but I think we do have a beautiful photo. I mean, they both look so elegant. Mrs. Bush's dress was so beautiful. Do you have any other story to add? I have a this? funny one. <laughs> so everybody, when, when it was right after I became social secretary, it was, um, it was the big event that was happening a few months later. And everybody, the, the whole White House staff worked, worked extra hard. I remember they cleaned the chandeliers in the East Room and they really went out of their way to make sure everything was in tip-top shape. And um, we, the, the women on my staff were helping take the RSVPs. We did also take them usually over the phone and it helped ease people. The people often had questions about arrivals and whatnot. And, um, and one of the interesting requests for that dinner was there was a woman that came to the dinner and it was, as Mrs. Bush said, white tie, um, and every, the women were all in ball gowns, and she was so worried that, or not so worried, she was concerned that someone else might be wearing her dress, <laughs> that she asked if we could keep in our office a backup dress <laughs> that we hung in our office just in case there was a duplicate. Um, <laughs> Fortunately, it didn't happen. She was in good shape. She didn't have to change. But that state visit was incredible and um, was a, a special visit. We did have some other yes. um, incredible visits. The Pope came to visit um, while I was there. It happened to be the day of his birthday. And mm -hmm. Mrs. Bush had the great idea to um, acknowledge it. So following the arrival ceremony on the South Lawn, which happened to be mm -hmm. the largest gathering of people at, at that time at the White House, at that up to that point at the White House, mm -hmm. um, was for this arrival ceremony for the Pope. Um, everyone came inside, the staff, the immediate staff with both um, delegations came inside and uh, saying happy birthday to the Pope. Uh, and Mrs. Bush also thought to have all the window boxes in the papal colors of yellow and white, which made for a beautiful photo at the end when they stood on the South Portico and waved to, the, to these um, thousands and thousands of people. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a special visit. And then... Um, you had um, Andrea Bocelli. Oh, that's right. That's right. Um, another really, sp it's things that happened spontaneously were some of the more fun things that happened. Um, Andrea Bocelli came to a Christmas dinner um, and very casually at the end of the dinner um, with his significant other, he walked to the Steinway piano sat down and began playing and singing. Mm -hmm. So the whole dinner got up and, and circled the piano. And it was remarkable to have this spontaneous, private concert, concert <laughs> um, at the end of the dinner. It was quite a finale to an already glorious evening. Mm. So Jeremy, this was not a spontaneous event for the White House that night, but it was for you. The uh, um it was a Sunday. I was at a friend's house for dinner, and we always had to carry multiple phones because the phone, we had our own phone, and then we had a phone for work, and later we had a, a phone separate that was for the that was principals only. But at this point, I again, I was in my first months, and I got to this dinner, and I put my phone in the entranceway on the table, and we're sitting at dinner, and there is someone from the New York Times, the Washington Post, our hosts, and 
about eight others, and I hear a phone ringing. And I'm like, what idiot <laughs> brought their phone, didn't turn it off, and, and then I thought, oh, that could be me. <laughs> so I excused myself, and I got to the phone, and it said, close hold, meaning I couldn't say anything. President may be making remarks in the uh, East Room. And I was like, okay, so I just went to the host and said, I'm so sorry, I have to leave. And I just thought about on the cab, cab going to the White House, people talking at the table like, can you believe he just got up and left? Because I couldn't <laughs> imagine what secretary. on a Sunday, Sunday night, they're like, social secretary, such bad behavior. <laughs> and I, uh, by the time I got to the White House, at that point, it started to get out and Secret Service told me on my way in, they thought they got bin Laden. Mm -hmm. And so it was this uh, kind of amazing night and all of the, you know, military, the cabinet, all the folks that had been downstairs were now in the blue room, and I was in the green room making sure that uh, everything was set up, and the president walked in and said, Jeremy, how's it going? I said, uh, good, Mr. President. I mean, <laughs> it's a good day. He goes, yes, a very good day. He was always very calm. I was, like, shaking. And um, <laughs> so as he's making his remarks, I'm standing in the back and, you know, just wanted to make sure nothing, no phones went off, anything. And later I'm telling my mom about this and she's like, um, yes, well, I notice in the photo that was in Time Magazine and everywhere else, she goes, you're the only one not in a suit, a coat You're in a sweater. <laughs> And I was like, well, I was at a dinner and I didn't think it was appropriate for me to go home when it said close hold could happen in an hour. Not only that, though, you're sort of propping up the... Uh, the no, nothing. Uh, to, that, it was enough. It was enough getting the... But the, the, the other part of this... So the president makes his remarks and he walks off and the camera turns off. And then I'm told, you've got to get the president. He's got to start it again. Because that was for the... TV, that was for the networks, and it's a share. Now we got to get the print media and all of them, all their photographers in to take photos of him doing it, but they weren't allowed into this. Mm. So I had to go tell the president, you, we've got to do the start of this again. And he looked at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I said, just for, the, for, the, for history. Just go out. It was, he wasn't happy about it because he had no idea that it had to be. But it, so any photos that you see of him giving that speech, he's not really giving that speech. <laughs> that was after. Okay, so there is a saying that the White House goes wherever the president goes. So expectations for presidential entertainment remain very high regardless of location. Gail, I'd like you to share a very interesting story about a visit with the Reagans to China. In 1984, we went to China, and um, always in China, there, there would be a banquet in the Great Hall hosted by the Chinese for about 600 people. And um, then the next night, we Americans would host our return banquet in the same hall with the same people. I, I don't know why, but that's the way it, it always happened. Anyway, at, uh, in 1984, there was the first commercial hotel in Beijing built by IM Pei. It had a revolving bar at the top. I couldn't believe my eyes. Um, it was very modern. And so Mrs. Reagan said, well, we'll host our return banquet in the hotel. And I thought, okay. Um, and she said, and it's Thanksgiving, so let's have a traditional Thanksgiving dinner. And I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> and we didn't have a budget, but we did. <laughs> but we we did have public opinion, and so she was very conscious that she was not going to fly over a chef and everything else. She was just going to fly me over. So I flew over with 150 giant butterball turkeys, <laughs> frozen, um, 
and cranberry, canned cranberries, because, you know, I had to make it simple. And the chef at the hotel was Chinese <laughs> and um, didn't speak English. Um, but my advance man um, got off the plane just jabbering away in Mandarin, and I was like, John, he was my age, and he said, oh, I did my mission work here. here. His name was John Huntsman. Mm. And um, so he was my liaison with the chef, and we fixed Thanksgiving dinner, um, stuffing it and all, um, explaining it to this poor Chinese chef, and um, it, it came off. I don't know if the Chinese really liked, liked it. Um, <laughs> you know, we were only about 20 Americans who got the joke of, Chinese, of, of Thanksgiving turkey, but, um, but it was our statement that we were not going to mm -hmm. just do what the Chinese always asked us mm -hmm. to do. So that That's was great. our Thanksgiving dinner in 1984. Well, the White House certainly is a place, a, a global stage, and it's a museum. It's a symbol to people around the world. But we often overlook the fact that it's also a home. And so, Amy, I'd like to ask you to maybe talk about a, mem a memorable moment or two of some family events that took place at the White House. Uh, Mrs. Bush mentioned earlier about um, the reception for Jenna and Hen Henry. They, as you all know, got married in Crawford, Texas, but could only invite so many people. So in an effort to celebrate with extended family and friends, the President, Mrs. Bush, ho hosted a beautiful reception at the White House where they did a receiving line in the Rose Garden. And Nancy Clark did the same flowers at the White House that were in Crawford, Texas. And the um, leche wedding cake was also served and they had the Marine Band Orchestra perform um, in the East Room for dancing. There they are um, cutting the cake, so which is a wonderful photo. So pretty. It is a great photo. Um, and then another one that I thought was incredibly special was Mrs. Bush hosted her high school reunion at the White House. <laughs> They look so happy. <laughs> it is. It started out just being her high school, but then she graciously offered to invite, included the other two high schools in Midland, Texas, Carver High School and Lee High School. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, of all the events that I worked on in the White House, I don't know if I know of a giddier group walking through the doors and a few actually with tears in their eyes. They were so touched to be included. And it, it, this, is, uh, this is the group at the arrival ceremony. Uh, well, not arrival, it was a helicopter yeah, the landing. The president back. was coming back and, um, from somewhere. And so this is at the, um, the helicopter arrival. And then that evening, there was dinner and dancing in the White House. It was spectacular. That is so fun. Well, I thought a nice way to end our conversation, our remaining moments here, is to ask each of you of the events that you hosted, helped to host, that you witnessed, the legendary artists and performers that each of you had a chance to work with. Can you give us a story as which one was your favorite and why, or a special memory? And Gail, I'd like to ask you first. So, um as I had mentioned earlier, Frank Sinatra was really integral in, in our White House. He not only did all of our sound and light, but um, he sometimes performed uh, as well. And um, on for one state dinner, uh, his rehearsal was at two in the afternoon, and he was having lunch with Mrs. Reagan at noon, and then he was going to rehearse and then come to dinner later. Um, we had had our arrival ceremony at 10. Um, while he was having lunch with Mrs. Reagan, we were bringing in all of his equipment. And I got a call from the Northwest Gate that uh, they couldn't get the equipment in because the bomb sniffing dog had gotten tired. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and, the, and would not sniff. <laughs> and, and they, they uh, said, you know, I said, I mean, so I run out to the Northwest Gate, I'm going to make this dog sniff, right? <laughs> And it was, a lo it was a beautiful German Shepherd, but he was down and he was done. If you had had a budget, yeah. you would have had a backup. I'd have You'd a backup, have a backup right. dog. So, you know, I was cajoling, I, but he wasn't having it. So um, they had to get another dog, but the dog had to be brought from Andrews Air Force Base. It, it took time. The lunch was over. He had Frank Sinatra had no equipment. None of his none of his equipment was in. His his bandmates were there, but none of his equipment was in. Of course, I get the call that I'm expecting, Mrs. Reagan saying, Frank says that his equipment isn't in. I said, Yes, that's right. And you know, I learned very early on, as we all do. The, the, the risk of throwing people under the bus, you know, it's, you always weigh. I decided that this dog was going right under that bus. <laughs> because, because there was no way this would, could, could come back on me. So, so I told her, it's, it's the dog's fault. <laughs> We're getting another one. It's, it's in route. We didn't have a budget for a second one, but we're getting another one. It's, and, and there is a delay, and I'm really sorry. And even she was like, really? <laughs> so okay. they finally rehearsed. It was yeah, late. He's performing. It yeah, worked out. It worked out. Amy, there's two quick, two photos. I'd like you to just quickly say something uh, about love that. Yes. We had lots, as Gail, we were with Gail's administration, we had lots of country western stars that were wonderful, but this was um, a state dinner for Ghana, um, the president of Ghana, Kufour, and uh, like Jeremy, we had the Lion King perform, and it was a beautiful evening, a beautiful fall evening in the Rose Garden. The lighting was perfect. Mm -hmm. There were beautiful, bright costumes. It was a magical evening, um, so dinner was in the house, and then everybody went, proceeded to the Rose Garden for the entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, and then another special one was it's for the infamous this Berlusconi, is for Berlus dinner. The Berlusconi dinner. Um, the Jersey Boys came to perform in the East Room, and one of the guests was Frankie Valley. And at the end of the <laughs> evening, uh, he, uh, President Bush thank them, and then actually invited Frankie Valley on stage, um, yeah, which was a fun, night. a fun night. Jeremy, I'm gonna give you the last word on entertainment. So Aretha Franklin <laughs> no was spot. amazing, <laughs> and amazingly difficult she could be. <laughs> so uh, at this, in performance at the White House, I, Kathy McGar, who was uh, with PBS uh, working on the in performance, he said, you've got to get to the president when you find a break of her singing to go up and end it because she won't give up the mic. <laughs> so the, she's singing and it's, you know, going well and she has a choir behind her. Now, I have told the president that there are some performers who play very well in their own playpen, but not so well with others. <laughs> and he says, so what's Aretha done? And I explained that he just had to go up. And he goes, well, you just tell me when to go up. So Aretha is singing beautifully, this choir behind her, and she, as she's singing, she goes down and she gets, and then she goes, lift me up. And the choir is, lift me up. Lift me. And I realize she can't get up. So I could do one of two things. I could be a gentleman and run up there and help her get up. But I thought that could ruin the shot. So instead, I ran over to the president. I said, now, close it. And he gets up there and he closes it. 
And then the choir lifts her up, and later she says to me, when I'm singing, when I'm saying lift me up, someone's got to lift me up. And I just looked at her, oh, I have no idea. Well, you all, that is a great story. You all are incredible, <laughs> terrific in the roles that you have played as part of White House history. You are part of a very special club, and you alluded to this earlier, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy the Social Secretaries Club, this uh, group, the Sorority Plus One, that all have help each other. Uh, here you are, I think you're hosting them here uh, at the White House. This represents Social Secretaries from the Lyndon Johnson administration to the Obama administration. You rely on each other and you, a world of history and stories um, that you have shared. I'd like to reflect on one social secretary that is in this picture who is um, from Dallas, Linda Faulkner, who just recently passed away, who was your successor, right? She was my successor, yeah, and she was a, uh, She's a Dallas girl. She went to high school here at Highland Park and she brought everything that Texas has to her job in the way that it was just this charm, this Texan charm that she had. It was easy, she was easy, she was smooth, she was unflappable and uh, she was really um, a remarkable woman yeah, well, and she will be missed. And be. And long remembered. She was a good friend to us at the Historical Association as well. Well, I want to thank Jeremy, Gail, Amy. It's a fascinating conversation, a lot of fun, a lot of the behind the scenes stories. We learned a lot about your critical role and entertaining at the White House. And so I hope everyone here has enjoyed the conversation tonight. Thank you, Mrs. Bush and President thank Bush you. and everyone at the Bush Center. We have a, a few announcements for you. Of course, we want to thank Next Point again for endowing the Engage at the Bush Center series. And next up at the Bush Center is an event for members, the for a family Easter celebration, which will happen on uh, Saturday, March 23rd at 10 o'clock, just like the Easter egg roll. Each of you have presided over those. There'll be Easter egg hunts and a bunny petting zoo and a chance to visit with the Easter Bunny for all the little kids. Your Easter experience includes admission to the museum, but remember you have to be a member. So head to the bushcenter.org website to register. And save the date for what I know is a favorite of Mrs. Bush's, the Laura Bush Book Club edition of Engage at the Bush Center. Heather Morris, whose books include the worldwide bestseller, The Tattooist of Auschwitz, will be here on May 14th. Wow. So reserve your tickets at bushcenter.org. Again, thank you everyone for coming. You can visit the museum on the way out and don't forget shopping in the store. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>